Blimey, that was good. Can I just say, before we start, for those of you who don't know, if you can scan that QR code, uh, you'll be taken to something called Slido, which will allow you to ask questions, which I feel totally at liberty to ignore. Uh, so we'll see how things go. But I've got an iPad here that will let me keep an eye on the questions as they come in. So if there's something you really want to ask, if you stick it in the Slido and send it, then there's a chance it will get asked. Uh, the other thing is, because we're very populist at heart, you can vote for the questions you want me to ask. Good so God. I will see the most popular questions at the top of my list. So if there's something you think, oh yeah, I'd like to know the answer to that, uh, then if you vote for the question that strikes you as the most interesting, I will see it. Okay? We'll see how that works. It might not work, and as I said, we might end up, I mean, this is Neil Kinnock, we might end up spending an hour on the first question, but we'll see what happens. Try to avoid <laughs> referenda. <laughs> Right, without further ado, uh, this is Neil Kinnock. He was leader of the Labour Party. I mean, I don't really need to do his bio, do I? Uh, Vice President of the European Commission, head of the British Council. I've got one question to start you off, because I never get this right. The seat you were first MP for, we, we Googled this today and got someone to say it with a Welsh accent, because I used to say bedwetty, which is clearly wrong. Yeah, and that was your satirical phase. Yeah, all right. Yes. So go on. Okay. Bed Westy. There we go. That's very right. easy. Try and say it. Yeah. All right. I want to. I mean, you've had such a long and distinguished career. There's a lot to go through, and I want to start off. You know, back then when you were leader of the Labour Party, we'll spend most of our time on contemporary politics. But God, it must have been a soul-destroying job to be leader of the opposition against Margaret Thatcher, wasn't it? Um, I'm one of the very few people in the world who's fortunate enough to be able to absolutely date my midlife crisis. <laughs> it started on the 2nd of October 1983 and it ended on July the 18th 1992 <laughs> after which blessed relief um, I, the, the problem wasn't Thatcher really I mean she was a prime minister with by 1983 a gigantic majority favored by large chunks of the press totally in control of a party which she lost of course through hubris and self-indulgence, but nevertheless, at that time, uh, she was mistress of all she surveyed. And my challenge and uh, the crisis part of my midlife came much more from the Labour Party than from the Conservative <laughs> Party. Um, and the difficulty was, when I became uh, leader, the party was bankrupt. It was shattered into fragments, not just divided. Uh, and the delusionists uh, were in control of the National Executive Committee and one or two of the unions. And the whole task, certainly for the first four or five years, was weaning them away from that illusion that the day would come when the electorate in Britain was so outraged uh, by the excesses of Toryism, the destruction, the uh, hypocrisy, the corruption, the abuse, all the rest of it, that they would rise up as one man and woman and bring about a democratic revolt. Um, and some of them still retain that view, hence Jeremy Corbyn. But uh, nevertheless, um, they took some time to wean off that because the problem was that when people have adopted policy stances in, as you well understand in politics, they, grew, they grow religious roots and they become devotees. And really there's a, a requirement of mass conversion then, not just winning arguments or even winning votes, but of trying to make people change their minds fundamentally in policy areas. And we, it took me a hell of a lot longer than I wanted to and much longer than it should have. But eventually we got there. I mean, we'll come back to the Labour. There's, there's a lot to be talked about when it comes to the Labour Party. But Mrs Thatcher herself was a pretty formidable opponent, wasn't she? Did you admire her as a politician? I mean, she was a... Not really. I, yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, what she did right from the outset was so destructive that um, 
you couldn't admire her excessive use of the power and the authority that she had. And uh, from 1979 to 1983, we lost 25% of British manufacturing capacity. And it was evident that she was mounting an organized assault against industries and therefore communities across the country. Uh, and I couldn't admire that any more than I would have admired uh, the technology of panzer tanks, um, especially if I was under fire. And consequently, I, um, no, I couldn't admire her as a politician because she had assets in getting and keeping that power, certainly in keeping the power and using the power uh, that are rarely, if ever, going to be available to Labour leaders mm -hmm. uh, and are not always available to Conservative leaders, but she exploited it assiduously and deployed these, this weaponry and these forces mercilessly. So I, I couldn't really admire that. Okay. I want to talk briefly about that speech, that party conference speech. I have to confess, I thought it would be a great idea to play clips of the speech, and the others in the team said I was being a pathetic fanboy. And it's a silly idea, so we shouldn't do it, so I was shouted down on this, but I think it would have been nice. But, I mean, I suppose the first question was, was the whole thing scripted, or did you add lib bits of it? Wait, the, the, wait. the 85, the... Oh, no, no, no. I, I wrote the speech, but then when I was... And therefore, the... Uh, phrases that are now repeatedly referred to. Um, uh, I'd written them very deliberately because I wanted to punch them where I knew it would hurt, in their own arrogant pride at their so-called accomplishments in, in Liverpool, which of course ended in ashes. Um, but then when I was interrupted, I responded and therefore the best parts of the speech were not written. <laughs> That's, that's my fate. But the best bits of my speeches are always extempore. Um, anyway, that's the story of my life, I guess. And that anger was real? It wasn't? Oh, yeah, I was bloody furious. I'd been, listen, I'd been bottling it up um, since the early part of 1984. Uh, and I wanted to do it in 1984 in the conference. It had to be done in the conference to confront them. Mm -hmm and then organize to expel them, which was a very uh, painstaking business because we wanted to conform to the requirements of natural justice with a completely inadequate Labour Party constitution. So I knew that the difficult part would be not the denunciation, but the follow-up, mm -hmm. and so it proved. But um, I couldn't denounce them in 1984 because it was the middle of the miners' strike. And if it had been heard at all, it would have clunked. But of course, a year later, not only were their excesses even more uh, visible, uh, and the forthcoming disasters more obvious, uh, but we were away from the miners' strike and the absolute domination of all labor movement thought and action uh, in the run-up to the strike, in the strike itself, and in the immediate aftermath. So m the time was right for me to be able to do it. Um, I would have made the same speech in 1984, but it wouldn't have had that effect. Now I'm going to ask you one more question about those, and I know it's a question you hate. But I'm going to ask you it anyway, just so we can set the record straight. It's, it's, for many people, it's a sort of accepted fact that the Sheffield rally helped lose you that election. It's myth. Um, and I can demonstrate it's myth because, first of all, the rally itself was barely reported on the day. Uh, one of the things that made me furious about the rally was not just the fact that uh, by the time I got there, uh, and I was, knew I was going to be late in any case, um, we were marched in from the back triumphantly instead of 
the agreed policy that I thought of just as presenting ourselves on the stage. Mm. Secondly, Glenda Jackson introduced me as the next Prime Minister, a phrase which I had forbidden. <laughs> and thirdly, the triumphant Hollywood bloody music was everything that I despised. So uh, by the time I got to the stage in this, with 10,000, 11,000 people there in the Sheffield Arena, uh, it was like a blast furnace. And I got up onto the stage and there was this enormous noise. The only noise I've ever heard like it was when I presented the Rugby League Cup in the Principality Stadium uh, and there were 80,000 people in the ground roaring their heads off. And uh, I thought, how the hell can people play on this pitch when you can't, literally you couldn't hear yourself think. And it was like that when I got up on the stage. Anyway, to try and cool it down, I did a really stupid thing, and that was to try to do what rock and roll and some great jazz musicians do, and that's to say, well, all right. And of course, like bloody idiots, they all shouted back, well, all right. So I tried it again, and they did it again, and I thought, oh my God, what am I going? So I said, hey, listen, we better get some talking down here. And uh, it quietened down. It only managed to squeak at nine minutes, at 28 minutes past nine, with John Cole reporting and said he'd never seen anything like it since the JFK nomination. Uh, and that was a very favorable report. No substance in it at all, because I'd got on the stage too bloody late to say anything for the television cameras. So it was a cock-up from beginning to end. Anyway, uh, it was barely, it wasn't reported that night. It was barely reported the next day, and then it was overtaken by other events in the election. And it wasn't until a fortnight or 10 days after the election that the myth of it was Sheffield that lost it started to develop. There was no polling evidence. I checked uh, with Philip Gould insofar as it registered at all in the opinion polls, there was a tiny marginal, less than 1% shift in our favor. And it had no impact whatsoever on the outcome of the election. Um, so it's complete nonsense. I, in one sense, I wish we could attribute that defeat to uh, that single event, because then I could simply advise subsequent Labour leaders not to do anything like that. <laughs> not that they would, not that they would, but anyway, it had damn all to do with the election defeat. It was already lost by then. Well, I mean, just, I mean, it's, it's difficult though, isn't it, as a party of opposition, you've got to look like you're ready for government without looking like you're being cocky. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's a hard balance. But just turning to the contemporary Labour Party, I mean, to what extent, as you watched Jeremy Corbyn's leadership unfold, did you think that you know, the reforms that you pushed through were being undone. Yeah, I didn't think of it like that, to tell you the truth. Um, no, I, I, you know, I didn't think, no, nobody's ever put it to me in that way. Um, I didn't think of it like that at all. I just, insofar that there was a main theme of thought, it was, this is what would have happened to the Labour Party if Tony Bennett become leader. Uh, even though Ben was vastly more capable in every possible way, from intelligence to charm, than, than, than Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, that's not Corbyn's fault, that's just how it is. But um, it, it, exactly the same illusions would have, uh, would have transfixed the Labour Party. Uh, not the whole party, obviously, but certainly those who were prepared to make their voices heard. And um, I mean, Jeremy, whatever his qualities, um, when people asked me about him, I said, look, I don't know anything about Jeremy Corbyn because he never figured. He, he was such a, a guaranteed oppositionist that we never made any calculations that included him 
or about half a dozen others in the Parliamentary Labour Party. Uh, it, it just, uh, he was sitting there as a Member of Parliament for Islington, my Member of Parliament, as it happens now, um, by some irony of fate, but um, it didn't register. I mean, this guy, by the time he became leader of the party, had been 33 years, a third of a century, in Parliament. There is no Jeremy Corbyn private member's bill. There is no memorable question or speech in a debate. There is no evidence of presence on a select committee or a standing committee. Yeah. All Jeremy did for 33 years, doubtlessly serve his constituency, fine, great, and go around groups of people who already agreed with him. And that's not really a test of leadership capability. I don't think it's even a very good test of representative capacity, but that's another argument. Um, so my predominant in my mind at that time was this is a guy who just can't do the job. And he certainly can't do the job in a way in which Labour is going to appeal to a broader section of the electorate, which is the task. I mean, it's a job that I strove to do, I failed to do. We picked up three and a half million extra votes in the process, but in the end, we were 1,240 votes short. And that's how we lost by 21 seats. And I knew this guy was never going to come anywhere near that. There was the phenomenal election of 2017, in particular circumstances, the last election in which I did any real work. And on the first day, I encountered people who said they would vote for the sitting MP, but they weren't going to vote for Corbyn. And they wanted my assurance that if they voted Labour, Corbyn still wasn't going to get in. That was 2017. But over and above Corbyn himself, I mean, when you looked at his Labour Party, I mean, were, were Momentum militant reborn? No, no. Uh, there were people around the leadership of Momentum, who were the remnants of the 57 varieties of ultra-leftist groups from the 1980s, who got older and absolutely no wiser. But one thing they did understand, uh, and that was the necessity, not to manifestly form a party within a party, with its separate organization, propaganda, etc., etc., uh, the sliver of the Constitution on which we managed to prosecute militant members. Um, so they didn't make that mistake. And what they did was mobilize a large number of absolutely devout, committed young people who genuinely and justifiably want change and want it rapidly. Now, I couldn't disagree with the word of that. I mean, I, that's where I am. I still want that. Um, but I believe that those youngsters, intelligent kids, most of them with certainly a secondary school um, uh, and higher education background, um, were driven by the desire for change and the belief that it could be achieved by declaration. Um, and hell, any of us who haven't been through that feeling when we were in our late teens, early 20s, must have missed adolescence altogether. So I don't blame them at all. And by opening up some new frontiers, fresh thinking and so on, um, momentum uh, made a useful contribution and was never militant because it never, uh, despite the ambition of some of those in the leadership, uh, had any form of clandestine operation. Okay. But notwithstanding that, have you been impressed by the way Keir Starmer has stamped his authority on the party since mm. he became leader? Yes. Um, and the route that he took, which was a heartfelt denunciation of anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. We're not going to have this, he said, on day one, and went to 
extraordinary lengths, highly creditable lengths, to deal with the sources of it and the people who took a, a different view. Beyond me, how any socialist can slip into being anti-Semitic. I, I simply don't comprehend it. I know how people got into that state in many cases, not in all cases, and that is by passionate support for the Palestinian cause. And in the course of that became so critical and so intolerant of Israeli government, the Israeli system, Israeli democracy, that they allowed themselves to use the vocabulary and uh, adopt the stances of anti-Semitism. Now, uh, I think it's inexcusable, but I guess I understand how people got into it. How they could remain in that mindset and not distinguish between the legitimacy of the Palestinian cause and the legitimacy of Israeli democracy I simply don't comprehend, because I've had never in difficulty. Many of a previous generation of leading Israeli politicians in the Labour Party, and Mapai, Mapam, uh, were personal friends and good comrades. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they knew that I objected to and directly challenged the stances and policies they'd adopted so far as the Palestinians concerned. Obviously those Labour politicians included several who were actually standing up for an entirely different and democratic arrangement with the Palestinians and showed enormous courage in the context of Israel in saying so and doing so. I'm talking about people like Abba Eban. Somebody said to Abba, um, Mr. Eban, why do you insist on talking to the Palestinians? And he said, well, I've discovered um, that our friends already agree with us. And there's not going to be a settlement unless and until other people do. And it was, it's such a simple analysis and so fundamentally right. Anyway, that's all, by the way, how anybody who's thinks they possess the socialist values and virtues can have a scintilla, an atom of anti-Semitism, God knows. Or how they can be so casual as not when anti-Semitism is denounced, go with it 150%. And that's why I find Corbyn's stance extraordinary, absolutely amazing. One of the things that so-called modernizers in the Labour Party often complain about is that the Labour Party just isn't as ruthless as the Conservatives. That's to say, you know, they're not as single-minded in their determination <laughs> to win. You've, you've sort of touched on this already. I want to dig into it a little bit. Do you think there's truth in that? that oh, yeah. I, listen, the Conservative Party, from day one, uh, back in the early years of the 19th century, the 1830s, has existed in order to win power. Now, on our side, a lot of our people quite like winning elections, but they've all got all kinds of reasons for belonging to the Labour Party that uh, don't begin with wanting to win elections. Hmm. Uh, with them, with the Tories, it's a function of their conservative membership. With us, it's a purpose to be pursued. And that's the difference. I mean, I remember one of, the, one of these events about four years ago with David Lillington, he said, uh, the Tory party go out and seek converts, the Labour party go out and seek traitors. Mm. And it struck me that there was sort of an element of truth in that. The sort of ideological purity comes before anything else. On the well, I, to some extent, I mean, that I can understand why Lidington would say that um, it's a bit too sophisticated, really. It's uh, <laughs> uh, not about the Tories, um, but they always want, or oh, let's put it, I was going to say, they always want converts on their terms. No, they will put up with association. 
I mean, I used to go to young conservative do's in Abergavenny and Brecon because they had the best looking girls. I mean, <laughs> as simple as that. And um, I mean, it never managed to convert me, but, but nevertheless, and I must say the young ladies didn't try very hard. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I, there is a bit of her hair shirtery about our lot. Yes, there's no doubt at all about that. Um, and those, the reasons for that, you understand, I understand, and they're fairly straightforward. Um, but, I mean, George Orwell talked about the most enjoyable indulgence of the ultra-left, he said, was chanting, fee fo fi fum I smell the blood of a right-wing deviationist. <laughs> and uh, there's, there's always been a bit about that. The, the problem is this. Because we are democratic socialists, we have convictions. And if those convictions are deep-rooted uh, and redoubtable, we're not afraid of, of compromise. We realize that progress is incremental. That you take away half a loaf sometimes when you'd much prefer to have the whole loaf and then come back again and try to negotiate for the rest of the loaf. That's uh, right. But there are people, naturally, whose convictions are relatively shallow. And they are terrified of compromise. So they have to have purists on their t-shirts or their bumper stickers all the time. And it does mean that because they're afraid of compromise, that they fear that this will attract uh, the, the accusation of being uh, traitors, betrayers, deviationists, um, then they hold on to that. And of course, the longer you hold on to that, the closer it becomes to uh, a happy clapping religion. And th that's fundamentally the problem. The other the thing that grows out of it is, sorry, I'll finish with this. That's right. There have always been, since the earliest days, maybe before the earliest days, people in the Labour Party or the Labour Movement who prize power in the Labour Movement more than power for the Labour Movement. And that's the fundamental division. But, but there's all, isn't there also on the left a hideous sort of moral superiority problem? That, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. Of, I get it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, but it's very hard to win converts if you just think you're morally... That there's a the moral problem with Well, you opponents. don't find many people who feel themselves morally superior going out and knocking bloody doors. So we haven't got to worry too much about right. those. Um, but, of course, they're always going to be more reported uh, because they're seen as a source of embarrassment to the Labour Party mm -hmm. and consequently the appearance is given that they're much more substantial yeah. and influential than they ever are. Except for there have been odd periods in our history. Uh, the late 70s and early 80s was one of them when they really did have a uh, degree of authority over labor policy making and labor presentation that they haven't had much otherwise. Okay, we're going to just talk a few more specifics about the, the Labour Party. Everyone on Slido is talking about uh, EU policy. So I suppose the broad question is what you think about the Labour Party's policy on the EU. And Matt Bevington, formerly of this parish, has asked, has Keir Starmer set his red lines on the single market and the customs union too hard and too early? Um, I don't think it's a secret that uh, I wouldn't have done it quite like that. But this is me now, private citizen, uh, and he's the leader of the Labour Party. Now, I comprehend why he's taken that very assertive line. Uh, and I worry uh, with great loyalty about how it will be possible to achieve the ambition or progress towards fulfilling the ambition of a sustained high economic growth rate in the absence 
of our engagement in the single market. Now, uh, put aside, if it's possible, all the arguments about engagement in the European Union project and all that it implies for pooled sovereignty, joint dis decision making, being a really substantial power in the world, mm -hmm. politically and economically. And just think in terms of the single market and the customs union. And it's very difficult to see, especially bearing in mind the OBR forecast in terms of the growth impact of breaking away from the European Union. Difficult to see how we can attain and sustain growth rates of even two and a half, three, three and a half percent, which not all that long ago was trend growth, by excluding ourselves and continuing to do so from a big prosperous market which was accessible absolutely barrier free. So I've, I've got my worries about that. I mean the leadership and the Labour Party knows about my views on this. I don't trumpet them but it's the reality. Um, I actually think that the path that they're choosing of negotiating a new relationship and in Rachel Reeves words fixing the holes in the Tories bungled Brexit I think that that is a path that can and should and will be exploited so the effects of our departure will be greatly mitigated there's no doubt about that but I I still got my worry strategically about being this far apart but that's that's Kia's judgment and I respect it I mean just on that I mean I'm quite interested have you have you modelled your post-leadership interventions on anyone? I mean, have you thought about this? You know, <laughs> former leaders can be an asset. I'm just trying to think of one that was. Uh, or former leaders can be a tremendous pain. I mean, is, it, is it something you've sort of given thought to? Oh, um, don't go that far. Gordon Brown is a real asset. Right. I mean, what he's thinking and developed globally as well as domestically. Um, no, but to the party, I mean, to the current leader. I don't mean... Yeah. I, well, I've got an abhorrence of backseat driving. Um, uh, John Smith used to be good enough to ask me in about once every uh, four or five weeks to have a chat about things. Sometimes technicalities to do with the management of the Labour Party, other times, or combined with that often, uh, broader uh, policy themes. Um, I used to see Tony whenever I wanted to or whenever he asked me the same with Gordon same with Ed uh, they were all uh, and still remain friends in any case comrades in any case um, but I've never uh, in any sense whatsoever approached them with what you ought to do is this never and I certainly wouldn't do it with Keir um, Keir Starmer is a very different sort of politician to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, Which is a and good that, thing. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the question in a way, isn't it? I mean, when, when he was up against Johnson, you could, you could kind of see the logic that you had sort of calm, rational, very dispassionate leadership against Johnson. Does that work as well against Keir Sunak? Uh, Keir Sunak? Yeah. Keir Sunak. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I almost said Beer Corner then. Uh, it, it does because of two things really. One, um, Starmer is an effective manager and an effective political manager which aren't always the same things. Whereas Sunak is only ever managed money. He's, he's never managed any people and certainly not political people and certainly not a political party. So that's one reason why giving evidence of the distance between the two one uh, who is calm because he doesn't know how to be anything else and the other one who is calm and mature as a characteristic of his personality and his method of management but the other reason and much more important reason is because it's not all bloody soap opera the other much more important reason 
is our country has been through and is going through a trauma of the absence of rational, mature, patriotic leadership. And what Starmer offers is rational, mature, patriotic leadership. We could do with a bit of, if you like, bank manager calm. And that's the guy. Now, for Keir Starmer to wave his arms around, stamp his feet, be demonstrative, melodramatic, like some other leaders I can think of, um, would simply, it would be wrong because it's not in his nature. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it would be wrong because that's certainly not what the country wants now. Mm -hmm. People say, where's the passion? And I say to them, try if you can have a chat with Keir Starmer and you'll know that his passion is cold, as cold as ice, but mm -hmm. by God it's effective. Okay, just a, uh, a couple of words on sort of devolved politics now. Firstly, there's a Labour government in Wales. Are there lessons that Keir Starmer can learn from how that government has handled power? Or think? different dimensions, devolved yeah, government sure. and, and national government, unitary government. Um, but in terms of trying to establish and pursue priorities that are meaningful to people, uh, from support for young families, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, the attitude towards uh, the gay community, uh, the attitude towards race and opportunity, um, they are trying to set standards uh, and uh, objectives that are worth pursuing in any case. So it isn't a question of learning from them, it's a question of trying to use what powers you have mm -hmm. to secure these advances. Now, the awful reality for Wales, and to some extent Scotland, not quite to the same extent, but still substantially, is Wales has been shortchanged by about three billion pounds since 2010, simply because of the effects of so-called austerity. And it means that in a country which has the highest rates of morbidity in the whole United Kingdom as a result of industrial background, poverty, uh, rural isolation, and all the other contributory factors, to extensive poverty and the consequent illness. You get that in a country and relatively low living standards for very large numbers of people. And your demands on the collective public purse are proportionately and justifiably greater. Mm -hmm. So cuts bite deeper. And one of the any reasons for faltering or ineffectuality that people measure, so far as Wales are concerned, are very largely attributable, very largely attributable to that fact that it is chronically underfunded. On Scotland, how, how should Labour go about winning left of centre SNP supporters over? What, what, what should be the message there? Well, demonstrating that to vote SNP is to express a protest, uh, discussed with centralised government, uh, resentment at the fact that Scotland has voted Labour and got Tory governments. Uh, if you just want to protest against that, then you can vote SNP. If you want to do something about it, you vote Labour to get a national government. It's as straightforward as that. There's a great question coming here. I'm going to ask you because it's about a time machine. Uh, <laughs> if you could go back in time, knowing what you do now, what more could have been done or could, could you have been done to prevent Brexit? Oh, God. Well, I would have stopped austerity and prevented the continual reinforcement of alienation and separation and devastation and loss and impoverishment that produced the idea that things could and would change 
if you voted to be, quote, quote, free of Europe. I mean, you've heard me saying before, possibly, that a large proportion of that 52% who voted to leave did so in optimism and expectation, mm -hmm. not in racism or stupidity or anti-Europeanism. They voted for what they thought was going to be a great, beneficial, even benevolent change. And what enabled that thought to be rooted with two things, really. One, the evidence of increasing and increased desolation in whole areas of the United Kingdom, not just England, but South Wales, uh, even parts of Scotland, though they far happily uh, voted to remain, but whole areas of England and similarly afflicted post-industrial areas mm -hmm. uh, in Wales and in South Wales and North Wales um, were infected by this pessimism about where they were and what was going to happen and the disadvantages that ebbed out from the central economic disadvantage. And um, when, some, when secondly, uh, the fact forbidders and liars came along with very effective, simple messages, um, people were persuaded that change could and would come. And the other thing, definitely you have heard me saying is, that of that 52%, there were a few, I don't know what the proportion was, who wanted to get out of Europe at any cost. But most of that 52% accepted or thought or were deluded in thinking they could leave the European Union at no cost or at very, very little cost. In fact, they were repeatedly told that. Mm -hmm and enough of them accepted it to produce the 52%. So the only thing that I was done or I could have done really, I mean, I campaigned and spoke and made speeches and did a few television things. Uh, I mean, apart from anything else, um, whatever, however acceptable or unacceptable, what I was saying was the fact that I had been a European commissioner and I'm getting a European Commission president uh, um, pr pension, thank God. Uh, <laughs> really, or oh, thank John Major, actually. Um, and these days, of course, he's pretty near to God himself, but there we are. Very sensible bloke. Uh, anyway, um, I, that cancelled me, really. Uh, any authority that I might have had in different circumstances. That was all gone. But just, just sort of panning out to British politics in general, I mean, one of the things we've seen post-referendum is the rise of sort of values politics as opposed to simple left-right politics that has shaken up our party system. Has anything like this ever happened before? In your, did you face challenges like this? And can our politics cope with this sort of cross-cutting division? No, well, we, we had uh, um, Section 28, mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, and behind that was, yes, basic raw prejudice. But it was deployed in order to demonstrate the quote, quote, normality of modern conservatism mm -hmm. and the quote, quote, abnormality of everybody who was against them. Now, of course, it was bloody rubbish and it was an offense against civil rights, which is what our country is supposed to stand for, though I'm beginning to wonder with the uh, REUL uh, Act and the uh, efforts they're making to withdraw from the ECHR. Um, but nevertheless, we had no reason to doubt that as a country at that time, we upheld civil rights. And there didn't seem to be much of a partisan divergence about that. Um, 
but along they came. I'm just giving this as an incident instance, um, and tried to use Section 28 as a banner uh, for conservatism, small C and large C. And it was a kind of initial skirmish in the so-called culture wars. I mean, it, it, it fell flat, really, because uh, British public opinion was shifting then, not radically, not rapidly, but shifting then. And the unreasonability of their effort to control the curriculum in schools was just a fringe issue at the best. But it gave us a glimpse, though we didn't know it then, of what was going to be pursued mm -hmm. uh, later on and is now being pursued at the highest echelons of the government. And it's potentially a real destabilizing factor in our politics, isn't it? It could be, but I think that I, most of the modern ele electorate is pretty resilient to that crap, you know. I mean, um, if, if, if we had a national slogan, uh, it wouldn't be Ichtin or uh, evil to him who do evil things or anything like that. It would be mind your own bloody business and live and let live. I mean, that, uh, that's, that's why I like this country very much. Um, and really what they're doing in the mail and the telegraph and uh, the, the leadership of the Conservative Party and so on is transgressing against that. I mean, yes, you can get Alf Garnet churning and burning, <coughs> but I mean, there was Alf, there was his missus, there was his son and daughter-in-law. He was out number three to one any time. And I think that's pretty true of our country. I mean, one, one, <coughs> one of the things you hear people say a lot about the UK now is that we are more polarised than we've ever been. I've always been a bit cynical about this because yeah. I remember the early 80s. What, yeah. do, what do you think? Is this the worst it's ever been? Or? Oh, the divisions were pretty bad in the 70s and in the 80s. Uh, they were easier to measure and to describe. Uh, industrial clashes. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 political riots, um, oppressive policing, uh, the way that Thatcher organized in preparation for a minor strike and then got the unexpected astounding bonus of no ballot uh, in the NUM and a strike starting in spring instead of in the winter. I mean, uh, even she uh, neither she nor Nick Ridley or any of the other others anticipated those bonuses. Mm -hmm. But she had organized like hell. Uh, and when people said to her, as they did, this is going to be extremely divisive, her response was, right. Yes, it is. And then got on with it. So there were those divisions. Now, what I observe today is the idea that there is an unbridgeable chasm between something called the graduate metropolitan elite and those who didn't stay in school past the age of 16 or uh, didn't stay in school past the age of 15 and might now be over 65. And yes, there are differences, divergences, uh, expectations, in some respects, values. But the idea that our society uh, is divided by masses of people who regard each other with contempt and detestation is bullshit. It's just not true. And um, you can identify these social groupings and their academic background and their scholastic achievements and geographically, where they live, what they paid for their houses, how much they're trying to find now. And what you see almost universally is people confronting dreadful pressures on their living standards and uh, extreme hardship in many, many cases 
including amongst people who never expected to feel hardship. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that everything, every part of the country increasingly has in common. And this is a historic first, certainly in the last century and a quarter. The expectation that your children will do better than you did is fading. Mm. The kids don't believe it any longer. And the parents are desperately trying to find reasons not to think it. So there are congealing forces at work, um, apart from the ones of love, respect, affection, um, uh, deference, um, kindness, generosity, uh, fellow spirit, um, community, all those things still exist. And the idea that there is this deep cleavage in our society of people being antagonistic to each other because of where they are now in our class pyramid, I think it's bloody nonsense. In other words, I think Professor Ford has got it wrong. Goodwin. Goodwin, sorry. Ford is... Ford has got it Ford's right. The other one. Goodwin's got yeah. it wrong. Sorry, mate. Just sticking, I mean, sticking with history and historic comparisons, you hear a lot of talk now that the next election is going to be a 92 or it's going to be a 97. Are those comparisons useful? Do they say anything to you? Not really, because uh, every, every election is different. Mm -hmm. Even the two elections of 1974 were different. And if there were going to be two similar elections, it would have been them, wouldn't it, in the same year, mm. uh, seven or eight months apart. So every election is different. Um, the background, you can demonstrate globally, graphically, how the background hasn't shifted all that much. Mm -hmm. But the responses to the background can shift. People's condition of life, not just standard living, shift. Their ages shift. Um, so every election is different and it's, generally speaking, set in a particular, quite narrow uh, window of history. Um, that while a lot of people will vote on the basis of their own or their parents' memories and experiences, that's a a uh, given the foundation, mm -hmm. the people who make a difference in an election are not doing that. They're not very consciously breaking away from doing that, but they are voting much more immediately on their experience of the recent past and their hopes for the not too distant future. I mean, so it's bound to be different. While we're talking about those very few people that actually make a difference in elections, are you a supporter of PR? Yes, yes. Why? Um, I suppose I can sum it up. Uh, I looked at the results in 1983. Mm -hmm. And I saw that uh, Margaret Thatcher had secured 150% of the power, which she used 1,000% on the basis of about 43% of the vote. And I thought, this can't be sustained. This can't go on. And, of course, every result since has tended to reinforce that. Even when we got a Labour government with a healthy majority in 2005, on less than 40% of the vote. Um, that simply reinforced my view uh, that we need greater proportionality. I'm not arguing for perfect proportionality. That would be fantastically complicated. But there are systems that can enable us, enable us to have uh, constituency members of parliament on a much more proportional basis. And that's what I've favoured for the last 40 years. Because I could never say it when I was leader of the Labour Party because that would have produced the headlines, Labour admits it can't win. And you simply can't have that in terms of demoralising your own troops or giving and new encouragement of the other side. So it's going to be always difficult 
for a main opposition party to say we favor greater proportionality. But I think that there's a remorseless rising of opinion in our country that says we can't really go on like this. And the problem goes much wider than just our voting system. Mm. It's to do with our whole unwritten constitution, the inadequacy of which has been exposed by the abuses of power, especially with the Johnson yeah. government. And so I think more people are thinking, uh, is an unwritten constitution that is capable of being manipulated and abused by those who happen to be in power an adequate way to run a modern democracy that is in any event much too over-centralized. So are you seriously in favor of a codified constitution? I am now, yes. Who, yes. Who would write it? Um, well, I would give the task, and this is... Uh, it I'm is, a uh, cynic, I confess on yeah, this. Okay. Well, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, you would be, that's your profession, yeah, right. crazy. Uh, <laughs> whereas my profession, as Senor Gramsci said, is uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Um, that's my profession. Um, but uh, the, the problem that we've got now and why we need a pretty comprehensive and fundamental examination is, yes, over-centralization. But under that over-centralization is a patchwork quilt of devolution, mayoralities, county councils, metropolitan authorities, and God knows what. So the citizen can be forgiven to be utterly confused about what the effect of putting across on a piece of paper really is. So I think that our structure of government mm -hmm. needs close attention and reform. Secondly, I think that our stratified system we're still in 2023, very, very large majorities of people in the most respected professions come through one avenue of education has got to be examined again because you can't have the diversity of a modern democracy that is multicultural, multilingual, multi-ethnic, multisexual. Uh, that uh, is ruled uh, not just in its executive government, but in its administration, in its legislature, in its justice system, by people with a particular common background. You can't put that down to coincidence. Mm -hmm. And I think that needs examination. Um, so uh, I think that the system of taxation that we employ which makes people pay more on what they earn than what they own. It needs examination. Because none of these things are actually fit for the giddy world of 2023 and beyond. All right, I'm not going to let you do a full pathology of the British so, state now. No, okay. But. No, I'm, I'm very All glad right. about that. <laughs> but it's nevertheless, that, that's why I say that among the things, among the things we should be looking at is our voting system. I'd give the task of that examination and to provide recommendations to a royal commission, a time-limited royal commission. Who knows, Anand, you might find yourself <laughs> on such a royal commission. I will certainly recommend you. And uh, you a long return. <coughs> no, no. A time-limited royal commission to examine whether Britain needs, just to put a simple point, a written constitution. Okay. So you entered Parliament in 1970? Yes. So alongside people like Ken Clark, Norman Tebbit, uh, across the dispatch box you faced Margaret Thatcher, as we still Tebbit. were speaking about. I think Tebbit was already there, wasn't he? But, right, but the yeah. point is, you, you, you sort of interacted with some major parliamentary figures. And if mm -hmm. we leave to one side the MP for Port Talbot, do you think we get the Abraham. 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 Do you think we get the 
the quality of MPs we deserve. Is the quality of MPs the same as it was when you were in Parliament? I think they bring different attributes now. Um, uh, because only change is permanent. Um, then, when I went in in 1970, I remember having a conversation with Don Cannon, who was a Nottinghamshire miner. We, we shared a, a flat together with uh, Kevin McNamara, uh, MP from Hull, but a scouser. Um, and they, they were great companions and great guides for me as a 28-year-old novice. And uh, Don was huge. He was six foot four, ex Coldstream Guards, Palestine Police, coal miner. How the hell? I said, you could only cut coal in Nottinghamshire because you've got uh, KPOC filled ski, uh, seams there. If you had to work in South Wales, you'd never even get into the pit. Anyway, um, but I remember us having a conversation in which Don said, if you were walking along the street, and there were a hundred MPs in front of you, you'd be able to tell which were Labour and which were Tories. And it was true. Labour MPs were smaller than Tory MPs. Uh, not universally, but if you saw them ranged, just look at, though not that they filmed it in those days, but look at those files going in for the Queen's speech. And you would see that the Tory MPs were three to six inches taller than the Labour MPs. I mean, it was as straightforward as that. Now, look, that was 50 odd years ago, 53 years ago. Bloody hell. <laughs> and the physique, the educational background of Labour MPs particularly has radically changed. I mean, Goodwin has got to hang up about that. Uh, that this is part of the metropolitan elite and all the rest of it conspiring against the proletariat. It's all bullshit. But, <laughs> but uh, I, I had to say to a program last week when they raised this, I said, look, um, when I was selected in 1969 for a very safe Labour constituency, I was 27 when I was selected. And in the final selection meeting, I was asked a question. You're just out of college, um, and you now work in the pits or in industry. What do you know about the rough and tumble of life uh, that would enable you to represent us? And I think this is the question that won me the selection by two votes. Because I responded by saying, look, if my parents working in the steelworks and a nurse had kept me in school until I was nearly 19, then kept me in university until I graduated. And then on graduating, I'd gone up to Markham Pitt and said to the manager, I was about to start. You wouldn't be selecting me, you'd be certifying me. <laughs> it brought the house down. And the reason was that those 150 working class people there wanted exactly that for their kids. Yeah. That's what they aspired to. And this guy who asked me the question really thought he'd bowled me middle stump. And when they applauded, he, his, he was sitting right in the front. His face was a picture. He was astounded because he thought he was going to carry the populist sentiment. Okay. And what he, 149 of the people were thinking. And that's why they voted for me. So that's what's changed. And uh, the, I think that MPs do a better constituency job now than anything that we did in the 1970s. Not on the big issues, standing up fighting a pit closure or a factory closure or fighting for a hospital, things like that. But in terms of the quality of responsiveness and service to constituents with the massive diversity of needs, requirements, hopes that they've got. I think that MPs are much better now because they've got the kind of administrative and research backup that we were arguing for 50 years ago. Okay. Um, in terms of performance in the Commons, 
the commons has changed. So the idea of a ringing, brilliant 20, 25 minute speech from Michael Foot or from Enoch Powell would be completely obscured today because they've got time constraints on the back benches and they've got time constraints on the front benches. Something that only existed by convention which could be breached if there was something really important to say 50 years ago. That's changed. Mm -hmm. So I can't manage the, the quality of that. I know in terms of quality of service, sustained service, MPs are better now than they were 50 odd years ago. We have obviously overshot, but there's one more question before we get to our fantastic quick fire round that I want to ask you, because I think today is 40 years to the day since your I warn you speech. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. What would you warn the British people about today? Yeah. Very quickly. The awful bloody thing is, I could virtually make the same speech now, and it would tragically just be as accurate as it was then. That's the awful thing. In spades. In fact, poverty and the insecurity that goes with it is actually deeper now. And the rich are much richer now, and the poor are at least as poor, and in many respects, poorer now. It is amazing. 40 bloody years, and I could still make the same speech. It's awful. Well, for those who haven't seen it, you should watch it. And now, you've talked about Matt Goodwin. We have a special New Elite quiz that I'm going to ask you. We ask everyone those. Oh, incidentally, Ollie, have you got the glass? I'll give you, give you that at the end. But this is a quick fire answer. This is one word answers, okay? Yeah. BBC or Netflix? Oh, good Lord. Netflix. Netflix. Really? Yeah. Blimey. For enjoyment. Right. Yeah, of course. Guardian or GB News? Oh, <laughs> Guardian. USA or EU? Um, EU, it's a false alternative, really, what but EU. Prince Harry or Piers Morgan? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Harry seems like a nice lad, really. <laughs> Greg's or Pret? It depends what I want. Oh, for heaven's uh, sake. Uh, Pret, because I've been oh, there. Oh, for heaven's yeah. sake, that is yeah. outrageous. Hotel or Airbnb? Hotel. Good. Tofu or sausages? Sausages. Leveling up or cutting taxes? <laughs> Leveling up properly. Bike or car? Um, well, car. I'm 81 years of age for Christ's sake. <laughs> right. EV or SUV? Um, this is in terms of preference. Yeah. SUV. Beer or wine? You're safe to say things like this now. Um, the right beer, beer. Maths or English? Oh, English, sorry. Sciences or humanities? Humanities, I suppose. All right, careful here. Football or rugby? Oh, Christ. <laughs> that's, not, I got, that's unanswerable. All right, that's a, you have one pass. Twitter or TikTok? <laughs> Neither. Cash or t contactless? Or cash. LTNs, yes or no? What? LTNs, <laughs> low traffic neighbourhoods. Oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I've got, we've got a traffic barrier outside our house, which predates us by many years. That's yeah. a yes, all right. Yeah, yeah. Imperial or metric? Oh, imperial. <laughs> Brownite or Blairite? Christ, that's impossible. Um, well, let's go with the most modern, brown. <laughs> Controversial. <laughs> Neil Kinnock, we have a little present for you coming over here, that's, which we hope you use. That's, oh, it's a good job I said beer, yeah. There we go. <laughs> Thanks so very much. Cheers, mate. Cheers, Thanks so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Cheers for that. Yeah. Thank you. Very kind. Limited edition, don't you know? Pardon? Limited edition. It's very nice.